every summer was like a new best moment of my life for 12 years. You could do so much stuff if you just a little creative in the way you do it. I really respected him as a little person. Having friends, like playing, playing in the desert, playing in the mud, getting dirty, that, that was awesome. Oh, we're going to camp. I'm taking my daughter to camp. You're going all the way to Pasadena to take your daughter to camp? And I'm like, yes, yes, I am. And so people who stay in the Pasadena area remember it. And you see the van driving down the street and go, oh yeah, there's the Tom Sawyer van. I mean, I can't tell you what, how important it was in formulating me. Uh, I had no way of comprehending any of this when I was there. I had a good time, but I didn't realize how important this was. Whether it be friendships or just the fact that I had an awesome thing that I could look forward to or my professional career, like I still did that while I did well in. Um, I just took the summer off and would do Tom Sawyer. And so you make friends of people you just know forever. And people move on and go different places, and, but I think there's always those ties and connections. And uh, you, know, you see a lot of people who have made life lifetime friends uh, at camp, whether as campers or as staff or as both. But I think that in like an ever-changing world, Tom Sawyer is a constant. The Tom Sawyer Camper, a familiar inhabitant of Oak Grove Park in northern Los Angeles. Tom Sawyer Camps was originally founded in Laguna Beach by this man, Bill Schleicher, in 1926. These campers come in many a variety. The day campers, the Tom Sawyer II campers, the youngsters of pre-camp, and the adolescents of outpost. But what is it that makes these campers tick? It isn't the activities as much as it is the counselors who facilitate those activities. The junior counselor, the assistant counselor, the senior counselor, the director who oversees all activities, and the specialist staff. These are the building blocks of Tom Sawyer Camp. Every camper has some hope of one day becoming a Tom Sawyer counselor. Like the overall experience is really the same, even though they're doing like lots of different things. And I don't think there are many facets in like m like my life or anyone like that I know's life that are that constant. Whether it be like your friends that you kind of like go in and out of different friend groups, or like your job or school, like you kind of go through like four year kind of periods when you're growing up, college and high school and all of that. And at Tom Sawyer, you can kind of trans, like, transverse all these like changing times in the world and in your like little world as you're a kid, and it doesn't change. Like they always remember your name. You always have a place where it's like familiar and you can grow with. They're going to Bora Bora for the summer, and they're you know having those experiences that many many people don't have. They're missing out on, you know, the, the, the values that camp brings. You know, parents say, oh, don't touch that, or don't do that, or, you know, um, and don't come home dirty, for Pete's sake. Uh, well, that's what was so charming about Tom Sawyer. When we first got involved with it, Tom would come home filthy. We'd have to hose him off in the front yard, you know. That was what we were wanted for. And that's the way I grew up. That's the way my wife grew up, uh, essentially. And so we understood that, that, that the freedom for kids to be kids. And to take children and put them in an environment. Some of them complain, how am I gonna have a good time without my <laughs> Xboxer? And to help them to learn a different part of themselves. So I think as I grew, grew into like being a counselor, that's what I hoped camp could be for those like kids that I was working with, what I, like, I got to experience. In an ever-changing world, I hope Tom Sawyer plays a very big part, especially as the changes are so technical that children can be entertained more and more by electronics, that their relationships are over the internet, right? that they're missing family dinners to watch TV. Um, there is less and less human contact and less and less need for human contact. You know, or you had to be home before the street lights came on. That was the rule in your house. Did your parents know where you were? They had an idea that you were somewhere in the neighborhood, but they didn't know exactly where you were all the time. So I don't think that exists anymore. I think parents probably want to know 
more where you know that stranger danger kind of you know where you where your kids all the time uh, and you're a bad parent if you don't you know parents are a little bit different now than they were 20 years ago and you probably hear the term a helicopter parent you know and that's an easy term to use for a parent who hovers and who's nervous about their child and who's nervous about um, so learning skills on how to work with them to validate their fears but also to let them know part of helping your child grow up and develop is letting go, letting them take this risk, sending them to camp. I'm embarrassed to say, being the director 23 years, I only knew about Bill Schleicher when Mike Horner would talk about him. I know that he started Tom Sawyer Camp, so that alone <laughs> makes him a giant. <laughs> um, I know that he had the concept of kids playing enjoying nature, um, the natural ways of playing and enjoying their childhood. And that's really what, what got us into it in the first place. Um, I think it goes back to the Bill Schleicher philosophy that, that he was a, a, just a, a wonderful guy dedicated to kids and dedicated to what he was doing and with some wonderful ideas about what kids like to do to have fun and in the same process learn something. And I think he started it was just boys. I knew it used to be Laguna Beach. You know, I don't know the Tom Story of Laguna, so I have, have no idea. I imagine that the, you know, the creativity and playfulness of, of that was really important. The first camp they had, uh, my dad and Al, Uncle Al, was in Laguna Beach uh, in Bluebird Canyon, which was then totally natural. Uh, they were up they had a campsite on a hillside and uh, dad was a very unusual character grew up on a farm in Idaho a homestead actually where uh, his dad had come over from Europe and they homesteaded uh, raw land in Idaho very rural Idaho and he and his brother Al as young people eight nine ten years old were out trapping in the rivers and um, Later they, of course, both moved down to Southern California, but they just loved the out of doors and felt that city kids didn't get a chance, as they had been given, to get out and just in the natural out of doors and, and get dirty and get in the water and uh, experience nature. One of the things that the Slickers were have fun with, they always referred to people as city Slickers, who were not real campers. Now, I was too young for the Laguna Beach camp. I wasn't born till 1937, so, and that camp was well underway by then. Uh, and it all happened, my dad was a dentist, and he did some dental work on the Schleicher family, and uh, this was still Depression time, and I know that they made a deal, <laughs> paying partly for the camp at least with what he did to fix their mouths up. <laughs> So that was kind of an interesting introduction. Well, anyway, I was there, I think, two separate summers. And that would have been the summer of 39, or 1940 and 1939. I think those were the two years that I was there. And I remember rolling into the Tom Slater camp with the T, you know, spelled backwards and so on. You had a little stand over the entrance of the place. And there were I, two or three sort of dormitory, not dormitories, but you had a bed and uh, there must have been 10 guys in there, 10 or 12 guys in there. And then you had a, a place where we all had dinner and lunch and breakfast together. And uh, the camp counselor that I was assigned to was a guy named Ed Elliott. And he was a teacher at uh, the Beverly Hills High School. And he turned out to be a tremendously important person in my life, and I stayed in touch with him for years afterwards. And then we would get involved in various activities that were, they had horses. Well, we sometimes, two or three times a week, we went horseback riding. And then we went hiking. And, uh, and then we, on the afternoons, we always took stuff down to the beach, and it was beach time. And uh, that was terrific. Then we'd come back and have a little break, and then we'd have campfire, dinner and campfire. And uh, I remember one of the songs we sang was Picking Up Pawpaws, Picking Up Pawpaws.
Bill was very big on having the kids work on an individual shelter in the sticks. And uh, we would, uh, he, he'd go and, and, you know, get trees with a Y in them and you'd put things in between and then you'd finally figure out a way to make a roof out of it. And, and I, we all worked on these things. So you had a, a mountain, or not a hillside with little camp guys working on this. And some days they'd do it in pairs or triplets. And that was a lot of fun. So now everybody quiet, move very slowly. And Dad slowly reached down in the trash can, tucked the tail of the skunk underneath him, apparently we didn't see it, talked to the skunk, stroked his head, and lifted him out of the trash can and showed the kids the skunk, a live wild skunk. And uh, he, that's the way he was with horses or any other animals. Uh, he just had a really... Well, that's where, the way yeah. he was with kids. He was a kid yeah. whisperer. That's right. <laughs> That's settled right. them down. That was always, even with our own kids, it was always settling them down. Didn't believe in killing animals. Uh, we weren't hunters. But I, I suppose if we needed food, we would have been hunters, too. I, I got a, went out and I found a rattlesnake. And uh, so what we did was, Al Slyker or Bill or somebody got a long stick that, and he got the Y in the stick, you know, like this. And uh, he did, by a little loop in the thing, and he got the rattlesnake and jammed it down so his head was in the dirt, and then they put the noose over his head, and they had him, you know, he was on the end of this device, and then I remember we finally cut his head off and skinned him. Skinned it, everybody wants the skin, and then you fillet it and cook it, and everybody gets a little piece. And ate rattlesnake. We had rattlesnake for dinner, and it was excellent. Usually all they want is a little piece like that. Um, they're not that good at eating. <laughs> well, I can't say enough good about the whole experience. I mean, it was a life-changing deal, because I was going to get nothing like this from my family. And it was not that they were not nice people or good parents. This was just not their deal. And. So Bill Slyker took the place of my father in terms of someone I could really admire, look up to, and with a completely different agenda. Well, I think that's a, that means a lot. Oh, that's, that's, uh, but that was my dad's philosophy, just um, love kids, um, build up their confidence by finding something, some gift that they have, and, and recognizing that gift, that special little ability we sometimes had problems finding these special abilities, but we could always find something. We were tough guys. Yeah. Sleep on the, underneath the stars. So we thought that this was the original building. It the was. door was on this side for the shack. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was late 30s when they ran and they lost the lease here. Mm -hmm. So about 10 years? About, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was just in the Hopkins Trust and... Now we're turning it into an urban farm. There was a door that went right through here, and this was the original little kitchen. Yes. That was right here. Uh, that co that's coming back. Okay, there was a kitchen. And then you come in here, and this was a bathroom. We always imagined all the kids like being in here. Yeah, the property goes all the way up. To the ridge. To the ridge. That's good, that's mm -hmm. huge. Yeah, well, it's 13 just, acres. They could have just explored everything and built all kinds of tree houses and stuff. Well, let me take you around. There's there's still now a lot to explore. It's no, I was never in a tent here. Pop. Only okay. after they, mm -hmm. they left. Yeah. See, I was born in 37. This camp was through probably about that time. That's the way the camp was, right here. 
And I'll bet they had paths and teepees all over this place. I see a landing right above you. Yeah, there's a good view. Up in here, they had various leveled out areas where the tents were, where the boys actually slept. You gotta imagine this. There was absolutely no houses or anything in this whole thing at that time. This was all wilderness. 1926 is when this camp started. That's 80, 84 years in this. On the whole property, as I recall, he had only about four buildings. And the rest were tents, you know, and uh, where the, the boys actually slept. But they did have a dining area, and a kitchen was right in there. He showed, it, he showed me where the kitchen was. And then there was a kind of a showering and uh, shower and toilets over a little bit further. So, But those buildings have burned down. Most of them have burned down or fallen down. Uh, he said one of the buildings was almost on the ground. Do you want to uh, have one of these basket programs, community supported? Oh, yeah. To be able to at least, you know, supply the immediate neighbors with organic produce. Uh -huh. And then we want to teach workshops on how to keep chickens, how to grow food organically. Oh, Great. Gosh. I'm going to come back in a while. <laughs> yes, and see, see when it's happened. all finished. The Laguna Beach camp was ceased because they lost the lease on the property. So they found a new home, which was up in the High Sierras at, at Horseshoe Lake, Mammoth Mountain area. And we drove up there, caravaned up, I remember we, we uh, all met, it was a six-week camp, and we all met in Brookside Park someplace, and we all had those wooden station wagons. Starting at age six, when I was a camper at Horseshoe Lake camp, I was the youngest camper there, and um, so I learned to live in the out of doors from a very young age, and I learned to love it. Uh, so that's how I got started with Tom Sayer Camp. Hey, well, you finally got up there, and it was cold and miserable, and snow on the ground, and the campground that was there was in elementary condition. Somebody had been up there doing some work, but not too much. So. We became a working, <laughs> a bunch of worker bees, and we hacked away at trees, and we built these teepee things where we ended up sleeping, and we, we put up a, uh, a place where we could all have dinner or lunch and breakfast at the same time. But that first year was also like a work camp. <laughs> but we also went swimming in uh, Horseshoe Lake, which was they had one area where you could slide down the snow into the lake, and it was cold water, but. You went in and, and that was great. My first ex memories were Mammoth Lakes. And there was all horseback riding, swimming, boating, uh, archery. Um, I can even remember hatchet throwing. Not at each other, of course, but uh, we had a target. I have another memory. It When Pearl Harbor occurred, I was on a weekend uh, Tom Sawyer trip. And uh, we came back. We stopped someplace to get gasoline, and this was like about, uh, oh, maybe 11, 30, 12 o'clock, something like that, and went in there, and, and I remember the antenna at the gas station says, we've just been bombed by the Japanese in Holland Lulu. And it, lo and behold, this was true, but that's where I learned about Pearl Harbor. I mean, you could, you could never expect you know, forget an experience like that. Uh, World War II came along and uh, there was food and fuel rationing. And of course we transported the kids from the Pasadena area, San Marino, Arcadia, Glendale, so forth, clear up to Mammoth and we, we were rationed on the fuel as well as food. So that became the problem at um, Horseshoe Lake. I know that, um, like many businesses, that his family got involved, and then his family ran it, and it must have been very sad for them, the end of an era when they thought they had to close Tom Sawyer Camp. What, 
four or five years mm -hmm. down at El Circulo. And uh, that was nice because it was for our exclusive use down at El Circulo, whereas Oak Grove Park was a public park then a city park and uh, but we brought our horses in there and tied them up to the horse tree and and uh, then we leased different swim pools around the area and uh, that was our program it was a boys camp tom sawyer boys camp until my sisters came along and dad decided let's have a becky thatcher park too so my sister wendy brought the girls in and and betty of course brought in pre-camp for three and four year olds. I later, of course, became the director after I got out of school and ran it for 14 years. Um, that was from about 1959 to 1973. So we had, at one time, I think I counted, we had about 800 young people involved in the camp. We, so we moved to La Cunada and these friends there um, recommended that we get our young son, Tom, six years old, into this wonderful camp that was in the area. From what I understand, <laughs> I was a pretty hyperactive child. The next summer, my sisters and I, we went to camp and I would come home at night and, and instead of the boy who uh, you would ask where, where you've been, been and I would say nowhere, so what you've been, been doing, doing nothing, nothing uh, it would be, I would, wouldn't stop talking about camp loved everything about it, was anxious to go every day, and for us, it was magic. We were going through a lot of things at that time, and we're making big changes. Mm -hmm. The Schleicher family sent out a, a letter to all the patrons uh, saying that they were interested in looking into some other activities for the camp, and was anybody interested in volunteering to help them out. And, uh, uh, we had been so impressed with the camp and so impressed with, with uh, Tom and our girls' reaction to camp that uh, I said, yeah, I'd be interested in helping them out. And uh, so I wound up meeting with them. Turns out I was the only patron of the camp that was interested in helping them out. <laughs> was, uh, I was uh, it. I, my dad, um, he was uh, a management consultant and he got to know the owner of the time, Kim Schleicher, and so he asked for some advice, and my dad was helping him out with that. And if he had money, he'd spend it. I mean, and he wasn't good at collecting money that was owed him, I can remember. So the business plan, the, comp the boys camp, went downhill financially. I don't think Bill was much of a businessman. Exactly right. Exactly. It right. couldn't have been. He was too much of a people person. Yeah, he really was. And uh, so I started trying to help them out, and quickly discovered that the camp was in in uh, rather dire financial shape. Um, Mike had been helping Kim with a lot of um, financial stuff around there and paperwork mm -hmm. for maybe a couple of years. Bill, who had started the camp in 1926. Um, Bill had had two strokes at that point in time and was uh, somewhat disabled, but he, he had really, he was a tough guy. He, he would go up to the Y and swim four days a week. He had several strokes, but you know, after a stroke, he would get out in the ocean. Amazing. And swim um, right out in front of Woods Cove, a mi how far, a mile or two? He wore a mask with a mirror on it so he wouldn't run into any rocks. So mean on his back. He, he had a paralyzed Three or four right times arm. He worked himself back. And he wanted he was determined to come back. So he'd get in the ocean and with one arm swim on the back and swim on his back up the ocean up to the main beach. Of course none of us wanted him to do that, but what there wasn't stopping my dad. He lost a sight in one eye and he lost his speech a great deal and um, he never did quit. He uh, kept trying to rehabilitate himself and uh, uh, it got shut down when Bill had his uh, strokes. Toward the end of that period because of the financial difficulties and dad had a heavy medical burden with my mother um, and of course the, that was his income and so the, a lot of the camp money went to support my mother's medical problems. We decided to go to a non-profit corporation and um, sell shares in, in a nonprofit corporation. And uh, that just didn't come out right. So um, I started looking at the numbers and trying to, trying to work out how they, they could get out of things. And we, 
I might recommend starting some new programs. And the thing I'll never forget is sitting across from him. Uh, he and I were, things were going very well at that time, and he was sitting at his desk, and I came in and we had a chat. And he was holding a pen, and I noticed the pen just fall out of his hand. And I looked at him, and, I, and then I noticed his face looked kind of funny. And uh, he was having a stroke right then and there. And I ushered him out to the car and rushed him to the hospital. And uh, he didn't make it that time. In 1973, uh, Bill Schleicher passed away. He had a, a fatal stroke and Bill died. And so that changed the situation with the camp quite a bit. And that was his thing. I was there just to help. Uh, we decided to move to the beach where we'd always wanted to live and, and uh, where I'd kind of grown up in Laguna Beach. And Ended up he decided he wanted to sell the camp. And so my dad was trying to help him sell the camp. Discovered that Tom Sawyer was so upside down that nobody was interested in it. And uh, they couldn't find anybody to buy it. And uh, rather than let Kim close the camp, my dad bought it. I am technically not involved at all, except in my heart. And so we wound up, we, uh, my wife and I, <laughs> wound up taking over the camp. And then when my parents bought it, I didn't want anyone to know my parents owned Tom Sawyer Camp. And so of course they knew because of my name, Horner. <laughs> but the only thing we were getting out of this was free camp tuition for our kids. That was it. That was the reward. My mom, the second summer, made herself executive director. So the first summer she was secretary, and the second summer she became executive director. What kind of insurance do we need to have? What, you know, what kind of safety standards? All kinds of things that, that uh, someone just coming into owning a camp would suddenly find themselves confronted with. Uh, Sally found herself confronted with those things, and obviously we talked together a lot. Uh, about what we were doing, what we were trying to do. And she said to herself, so I've never really done this camp thing, there has to be other professionals out there. So my mom went out and sought the American Camp Association and she found other local camps who were involved with the ACA and said, help me, how can I be good at this? I think we were always wanted it to be really good, you know, and, and not shortcutting stuff and not leaving things out and not just, oh well. You know, I think there was always a level of care and concern and this has to get done. This is really important. And, and uh, those things add up. Those things definitely add up. The one thing I knew when we acquired the camp, and this is very important, I knew that there was immense goodwill on the balance sheet. That do it doesn't appear anywhere as a number, but I knew it was there. So camp really started to grow quickly and my mom, my mom gets all the credit for that, for all that hard work. Um, but it was still really, I mean, the program itself was the same thing. Camp was the same. We had the same easy formula. Van transportation, horses, pool, forts, you know, the facility. And so it just grew. It was a slow growth, but it was a steady growth. We moved the office out of my house and into, uh, into another location. And, uh, no more worrying about whether you had enough money to get through the winter months. And uh, we started buying a lot of new vans and buying more equipment. Uh, so it took, it took the better part of five years to get all that done and to get the camp out from under uh, the, that, at least that cloud of debt. Um, that was about the time I was finishing college. And so I, I got involved with it. and. I was into a lot of the outdoor activities, you know, backpacking and rock climbing and windsurfing and all of this different stuff. And so I brought those activities to camp and figured out how we could include those activities as part of Outpost. It has been and is still, and even more so, a family business. Uh, Sally, the great camp leader, the, the lady that did such a wonderful job with Tom Sawyer Camps, uh, retired about five years ago, six years ago now, six years ago now, probably seven, seven years ago. So not that camp, because they didn't do all of this before, wasn't good, but I think it's really fine-tuned things. 
Um, it's really cleaned things up and made it, um, you know, a tighter ship. It just worked out that they took over the whole um, operation and they've done awesome, awesome things with it. I mean, I couldn't believe that. It just became so organized and we go up there and we just look around and we're so proud of all of them and the kids too, they've all gotten involved and uh, continued to work all these years, which is a miracle. For us, it's the end of like our to get like us being together as counselors. It's kind of sad. Like he was my first senior counselor, my first AC, and we had a great time together. We did. It was a lot of fun. We don't want it to end. We'll still keep in touch. Yes. We had a little piece. Tom Sawyer had a little piece, little part in helping many people become very successful. Tom Sawyer helped give me the confidence to start well. On. I think like throughout the Tom, like my career, I guess you could say, as a camper and counselor, Tom Sawyer. I learned so many different skills that have like slowly compounded and like definitely like make me who I am 100%. I don't think Tom Sawyer like instilled like my entrepreneurial like values, but I think Tom Sawyer like gave me the skills for me to like feel comfortable going out on my own and like trying something and possibly failing, but being okay with that. One of my four or five most important friends, and I see him regularly. In fact, I'm going to have a dinner with him a week from Monday, I think it is. He's, and we've been involved in a business together called Books on Tape. And uh, he created the idea, but I was the initial investor in it. And the two of us were the major shareholders. We finally sold it to Random House, but it turned out to be the best deal I've ever done business-wise. So I owe that friendship to Tom Sawyer Camp publishers of large newspapers and MDs, doctors and lawyers, teachers. And I actually became a teacher and so I'm a fifth grade teacher and so I now, uh, I'm in South Orange County and I uh, work with fifth graders and I feel that the camp environment I use constantly in the classroom and I think that the camaraderie of the classroom um, has come from the camp background. Sally retired and her daughter, our daughter, Sarah, who had been running pre-camp for a number of years and been very involved with camp, took over for her mom as executive director of the camp. This is my last day of this summer, so I'll just hang on it for school until next year. This is like my true vacation. But they'll remember you uh, when they won't remember some of their teachers. Uh, why? Because I like it. Exactly. And some of them, as they get to be 20 and 30 and 40, they'll still remember you. What you did at Tom Sawyer Camp. They won. It's really a, it's a uh, testimony, uh, a legacy of my dad, who. Uh, did so many things that were kind of first. Yeah, camp is, uh, I think camp's been a great thing for a lot of kids. And it should continue for sure. This moment happened way too fast. all that right <laughs> uh, that was good stuff